So the first thing then that we want to prove is that if we have our function f that is Riemann integrable over the interval a, b, and we have some non-negative constant real number, lambda, then if you construct the new function, which is lambda times f, which is defined, as you would intuitively expect, it carries any value x in that interval a, b to the value that f would carry it to times this constant lambda, which is non-negative. So it's just scaling the function by this non-negative constant real number factor, lambda. We want to prove that that function lambda times f is going to be Riemann integrable over the interval a, b, and that the value of the integral is going to be lambda times the value of the integral of f over that interval. So to do this, we're actually just going to need a few results about um, suprema and infima that hold in the real line. So let's say that we have a set x, and let's say we have a set y, which is defined to be all the values in that set x times lambda, where of course lambda is going to be a non-negative real number. And this actually is the reason that we have to split part one and part two into two separate results, because this result that I'm about to show you is very different for if lambda is a negative number. So lambda times x, where little x is an element of the set big X. So to give you an example, let the set x equal the closed interval 1, 2. So if this is the real line, here's 0, here's 1, here's 2. So it's the set of all real numbers on this interval here, including the boundary points 1 and 2. And let's let lambda equal 2. Then the set y would be all the things in here multiplied by 2. So you'd end up, of course, with the interval 2, 4. So when you multiply 1 by 2, you get to 2, so it will include 2. When you multiply 2 by 2, you'll get to 4. And then everything in between here, so if you take, like, I don't know, 3, just to be simple, it will have a corresponding number in here. You know, divide it by 2, and you'll land in this interval. So there is a number here that when multiplied by 2 gives you here, the number here. So everything in here will need to be in this set y. So that's our set y. Uh, so that's an example of x and y. Now, here's the result then, that if you take the supremum of the set y, it will be lambda times the supremum of the set x. And also, if you take the infimum of the set y, it will be lambda times the infimum of the set x. And this, hopefully, you can see is intuitively true for our example here. So, apologies for the dog barking outside. For the set x here, the infimum is 1 and the supremum is 2. So this set actually contains a maximum and a minimum. And for any set that contains a maximum and a minimum, the maximum will be the supremum and the minimum will be the infimum. So sets with maximum and minima, their suprema and infima are very intuitive. It's the sets that don't have maxima and minima, where it's more complicated. So the supremum is 2, the infimum is 1, and you can see that in the set y, which is 2 times the set x, our lambda in this case is 2, the supremum is going to be 4, the infimum is going to be 2. So you can see that the result holds true here. So we have the supremum is 2 here, times 2, gives us the supremum of y, which is indeed 4. And similarly for the infimum, the infimum of x was 1. We've multiplied it by 2, which was our lambda. And then we've got the infimum of y, which is 2. So we'll prove these nice little results in just a moment. But before we do, let me just say that they only hold true for lambda is greater than or equal to 0. When we come on to part 2 of our proof, we will need to consider what these results become when lambda is a negative number, but for now let me just demonstrate that they do not work if lambda is a negative number. So let's just consider the case that lambda is equal to minus 1. In that case, the set y is just going to be the negative version of this set, which will be the interval minus 2 to minus 1. Now, the infimum of that set is clearly minus 2, the supremum of that set is minus 1. Let's have a look what these results would predict. So the supremum of the set x, remember, is 2 
times that by minus 1, that would give us minus 2. So it would predict the supremum of this set to be minus 2, which is obviously wrong. Minus 2 is the, actually the infimum. Similarly, if you look at the infimum result here, the infimum of the set x is 1 times that by minus 1, it would predict the infimum of y to be minus 1, which is actually the supremum. So it actually gets it the wrong way round when lambda is less than 0. So these nice results only hold true when lambda is a non-negative number. They still hold true when lambda is equal to 0, of course. If lambda is equal to 0, then everything in the set becomes equal to 0. You know, if I set lambda 0 here, multiply every single thing in here by 0, and you get the set with just one number in, which is 0, and that set its supremum is zero, its infimum is zero, and you can see that these results clearly tell you that because put zero in here and you get the supremum of y is zero, infimum of y is zero. So it's a trivial case when lambda is equal to zero, but the results still do hold true for that case. So before we move on, let's prove these results because these results are going to be absolutely crucial to our entire proof here. So it would be a bit lame to not prove these results when they're the crux of the whole thing. So I think we'll probably just prove one of these because the proof of the other one is going to pretty much be identical but in reverse. So we'll just do the top one. Supremum of y is equal to lambda times the supremum of x. So to draw a picture, and we might actually just keep our picture of the interval 1, 2 going to, and in fact we'll make for the purpose of the picture, just to have the two intervals completely separated, let's go for lambda is equal to 3 now. So it'll go from here, 3 to 6, like so. This picture will help us capture the key ideas of this proof. So here is our set x here, and here is our set y here. And for the purpose of the picture, we have multiplied it by lambda is equal to 3. So 1 times 3 has come to 3, 2 times 3 has come to 6, and then everything in between has sort of got sprawled, or sprawled rather, um, over here. So we want to prove that the supremum, hmm, not in blue, we want to prove that the supremum of the new set y is equal to lambda times the supremum of the set x. So to prove that that number is the supremum, we need to prove that it's an upper bound for the set y, and we need to prove that it's the least upper bound. So how are we going to prove, firstly, that it's the upper bound? Well, we'll do it by proof by contradiction. Suppose it wasn't an upper bound, then that would mean that there was a number in the set y, a little y, that was strictly greater the lambda times the supremum of x. Now, why is that a problem? Because it's going to mean that there is a number back in the set x that is bigger than the supremum of y. You see, if little y is an element of big y, that meant that there was a big, a little x rather, is an element of big x such that lambda times x is equal to little y. That was, after all, the definition of the set big Y. It was all lambda multiples of the things in set X. So if little y is an element in big Y, that must mean that there is some element in the set X such that lambda times that element is equal to y. So now what we can do is we can replace y here with lambda times X. And now, of course, we can just multiply both sides by the um, additive or it's rather the multiplicative inverse of lambda. So this obviously relies on lambda not equaling zero, but we've already discussed why the result is true for lambda is equal to zero. So we'll just now consider the case that lambda is strictly greater than zero. And then, of course, there will be a multiplicative inverse for lambda. So now what we get is that x will be greater than the supremum of x. But, of course, this is a contradiction because the supremum of x was an upper bound for the set big X, so there cannot be an element inside the set inside the set that is strictly greater than it. So basically, in terms of the picture, what we've done is here is this is three times the supremum of x in this case where lambda is equal to three, 
and we said if that's not the supremum then there must be some element here, this is little y that is strictly greater than it, but then there will be a little x that multiply to give that and that little x is going to be here strictly greater than the supremum of x which is 2 and that follows from just this manipulation of this inequality inverting the multiplication. So that's why um, lambda times the supremum of x must be a supremum of the set, sorry, must be an upper bound for the set y. Now let's prove that it's the least upper bound. So again, we'll do this by contradiction. So if it's not the least upper bound, that would mean that there was something smaller than it. And what should we call that number? We'll call that u. So u is going to be strictly less than lambda times the supremum of x, and I'm calling it u because it's a proposed upper bound, such that all of those elements y, such that for all y is an element of big Y, little y is less than or equal to u. So if it's the case that this isn't the least upper bound, then it would be the case that there is another number that is strictly less than it, such that it is still an upper bound, such that u is an upper bound for the set y. But now the problem with that is that that's going to mean that there's going to be a corresponding upper bound that is strictly less than the supremum of x for all the things in the set x. So because um, if so what we can do is firstly manipulate this inequality here so we'll get that we can divide u by lambda. Lambda, remember, again, is strictly greater than zero, so its multiplicative inverse will also be strictly greater than zero. So we can multiply both sides by it without having to flip the side of the inequality. So what we can now do is with this u, we can consider the number u divided by lambda. That's going to be some number that's going to be strictly less than the supremum of x. But now look at this inequality that also holds true. We know that y divided by lambda is going to be strictly less than or equal to, sorry, not strictly, it's going to be less than or equal to u divided by lambda. And we knew that this held true, this inequality hold true for all y is an element of capital Y. And we also know that all the things in y are lambda multiples of things in x. So if it is the case that for all little y is an element of capital Y, little y is less than or equal to u, then it is also the case that for all x is an element of capital X, lambda times little x is less than or equal to u. That follows because every single one of these lambda times x's is one of these y's, and these are all less than or equal to u, so we have that this is going to be true. And now, um, doing the same thing that we've done here, we, if we multiply both sides through by the multiplicative inverse of lambda, this is just going to be the same as x is less than or equal to u over lambda. So this is a problem. We now have that everything inside that set capital X is less than or equal to this u divided by lambda, which is strictly less than the supremum of X. So that will contradict this being the least upper bound of the set X, because this is an upper bound for the set X, and it's strictly less than it. So uh, this one cannot be the least upper bound, therefore. So that's why there cannot be anything that is uh, an upper bound for y that is strictly less than this because it would imply that there is then an upper bound for the set x that is strictly less than the supremum of x. So we have then proven that lambda times the supremum of x is one, an upper bound for the set y, and two, it is the least of the upper bounds. So there is no upper bound that is strictly smaller than it. Hence, we have proven that it is the least upper bound, hence it is the supremum of y. So we've proven supremum of y is equal to lambda times the supremum of x if y is defined in this way as a lambda multiple of the set x. Now, the proof for the infimum result follows 
pretty much exactly the same way as what we did for the supremum result. I won't write it out in detail, but I will just briefly talk you through it. So we have here our infimum of the set x, we have here the infimum of the set y, and the proposal that we're trying to prove is that this is equal to lambda times the infimum of x. So to prove that this is indeed the infimum of y, we need to show that one, it is a lower bound for the set y, and two, that it is the greatest of the lower bounds. So to prove that it is the, a lower bound, let's do a proof by contradiction just as we did here, Let's assume it isn't a lower bound. That would mean that there would have to be some element in the set y, a little y, that is strictly less than it, so on in this sort of position on the picture. Now, just as we did here, that would mean that we could then find a corresponding element back in the set x that is strictly less than the infimum of the set x, which of course is a contradiction because it would contradict that being a lower bound for the set x. So that cannot be the case, so there cannot be an element little y that is strictly less than lambda times the infimum of x, hence this must be a lower bound for the set y. Now, you then want to show that it's the greatest for the lower bounds, so to do this again, proof by contradiction, suppose that it wasn't. That would mean that there would have to be some real number that is strictly greater than lambda times the infimum of x that is still a lower bound for the set y. So on the picture we'd put it here and we might call it L for lower bound. Now if that were to exist, again there would be a corresponding number back here in the set x that was strictly greater than the infimum of x that was still a lower bound for all of the set x, hence contradicting the infimum of x being the greatest lower bound of the set x. So it cannot have existed over here as it would lead to a contradiction back over here. So that means that this L cannot have existed, hence lambda times the infimum of x is a lower bound of the set y and it is the greatest of the lower bounds of the set y, so it is the infimum of the set y. So that's how you'd prove that. In the next part, I'll show you how to use these two results to prove our first part of proving the linearity property.